And then the more I was up there, the more I realized I was witnessing the most rapid effects of global warming. And I thought that the exhibit would be a great way to put global warming information out there in the context of the show while putting up these amazing pictures of the Arctic, showing people what they had never seen before and what the Arctic looked like. Um, and so that's exactly what I did. And from about 1994, 95 till just a year ago, I've had a large body of Arctic pictures traveling around with global warming text, whatever was new news, constantly on the walls with them. It's a very interesting thing to do because, you know, you, as an artist, you grow up believing that the cutting edge institutions are the, are the museums. And that, you know, you, you, you can do things in a museum as an artist who's speaking out that you couldn't do in a public magazine or that you couldn't do on television because you might be censored. You come in with a show about the Arctic and global warming, and one of the museum's big contributors doesn't happen to like your information about global warming. The museum takes nothing about taking it out of the show, and so it's not related to the show. You're an artist without this text, and so certainly you're not going to mind if we just take the text out of the exhibit. I, you know, I just have been amazed by the way being an advocate artist gets treated when it really comes down to calling a spade a spade, because postmodernism to me really doesn't want advocate artists. They want artists who, if they're going to say political things, have woven it discreetly into the fabric of some clever conversation. And it's not out there in your face. And more when it's out there in your face, then it's a whole other Now, at the same time, I was asked by a politician, John Cyberly, and the museum, the Akron Art Museum, if I would be interested in coming to the Midwest and photographing a very controversial but soon-to-be-made national park. And the reason it was controversial was because the park was created out of already established um, lands that belonged to people. And when Cleveland and Akron kind of had their economic meltdown and steel and big rubber left, and they hadn't reinvented themselves with Cisco yet, and some of the other um, internet trade that they now survive on. John Cyberlin was the senator of community, and it was left to him to figure out a way to bring more people to that area and revive that Cleveland area. And the Cuyahoga River had also become a joke in the 60s because it was so polluted that it actually caught on fire and burned for three days and they couldn't put it out. And it had become a disgrace and the Ohioans were mildly embarrassed that it was their industrial river that had had this, you know, um, epic nationwide event take place. And so there was an energy to clean it up and to do something with it. And so I really got the idea that the Cuyahoga was an old historic waterway and he would make it a heritage park and create a link between Akron and Cleveland that was all the farmland in between and it would become a national park. Well, the farmers down in the park didn't like that very much because they were going to be pushed out by eminent domain. And then this is also what this park was about. It had a lot of toxic sites on its perimeter. And it had a lot of cornfields where farmers who were afraid of going into bankruptcy allowed uh, Cleveland Industries to bury junk under their cornfields in exchange for some money under the table. And uh, those sites then went toxic and began leaching into the aquifers and toxifying the streams. So we found this site because this famous stream, Brandywine Falls, within the park, a very, very public place that's much appreciated for bridal photography, uh, was so toxic that people couldn't swim in it when they would be uh, acid burning under their skin. And it was because of that tired, filled site that I photographed here. And this photograph received so much attention that it actually drew, um, uh, drove the, uh, accelerated the EVA cleanup of the site. And I'm happy to say now all this is cleaned up and the water isn't toxic anymore and you can swim in Brandywine Creek.